Amen. It's uh, good to have uh, good to have the um, we mentioned uh, Iris and Primrose that are here this morning. Remember to pray for them this week. I know um, I know that they uh, would appreciate that as uh, as dad went home. Dad was one of our shut-ins, and um, it was always a blessing to visit. I always uh, was he always encouraged my heart. He was a good man, loved his family, but he, more importantly, he loved the Lord Jesus Christ. And so, uh, so we do need to remember the family here today um, and in, uh, in days to come. We'll, we will let you know, for any of you folks who are interested in the service, we will let you know what's going on uh, as we find out some information. So please keep that in mind. Um, I just want to thank you for praying for me this week. I made it through one week That's with dog. the dog. <laughs> okay, I asked you last week to pray for me. Um, and I appreciate your prayers. Uh, the uh, the it, it, praise the Lord. We were we we managed. I told Pam I will be happy when the dog goes home. I'll be able to finally sleep properly because the dog likes to go out at a certain time, and I want to sleep in. It's leave me alone, dog. Uh, but um, finally, I got word from my mom. I remember my mom and my sister. Uh, got uh, she we called and talked and uh, she's coming home on Tuesday. She wasn't going to come home until Friday or Saturday next week. She's coming home on Tuesday, so the plans we made for Saturday, we're going to squeeze in on Wednesday to take the dog home. Um, <laughs> the sooner the I shouldn't say that. You know, I I, I love animals. I don't want anybody thinking I don't love animals, but uh, it's not my it's not my dog. It makes it a lot harder when it's not your own. Um, but, uh, but praise the Lord. Today, I don't want to take up too much time talking about a dog. Um, <laughs> today, we want to look at Ephesians uh, chapter... Let me, uh, let me make sure I do this here. We want to look at Ephesians chapter 3 and verses 1 through 7. Um, here in this text, we find that the Apostle Paul is presenting something new. He started presenting that in chapter 2. And if you go with me back to chapter 2 of Ephesians... Ephesians chapter 2, uh, there at the, uh, at, the, at the latter part of those verses, towards the end of that chapter, I uh, remember last week we talked about uh, how Paul was introducing a new family, the family of God, who was introducing the building as Christ the cornerstone <clears throat> there in verse 20. And then in verses 21 and 22, he was introducing a new organ, or, organism, um, a, a living organism, which is, which is the church. And, um, and if you remember last week, I ended very briefly on the fact that there in verse, uh, uh, look what it says in verse 20 and 21, um, sorry, in 21 and 22, it says, uh, it says in whom the whole, uh, the whole building being fitted together grows into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you also are being built together for a dwelling place of God in the Spirit. And so uh, I mentioned last week three things about that verse, about the church and the need uh, the, the church has. And there's three things the church must have. Number one, it must have growth. Why? Because we're a living organism. We're, we're you know, a, a something that is living is growing, okay? It's changing. It's, it's maturing. It's doing all those kinds. We can throw all kinds of terms in there, but it has the idea of growing, okay? But also... It's a, it, it's, a, it's a church that's built together with one another, okay? So there has to be a, uh, a unity. There has to be a believers working together, living together, ministering together, um, you know, and, and sometimes that's hard. Why? Well, because, you know, I have a hard time sometimes. Maybe I should say it the other way around. My wife has a hard time sometimes putting up with me. Okay, now we have 60 or 70 or 80 or 90 or 100 people to put up with. Okay, that's tough. Why? Because I don't do it the way you do it. And you know, sometimes that drives me absolutely crazy. Because you're not doing it, you're not doing it the right way. Well, wait a minute. The Word of God says we need to be working together. And so there, there, there's a verse, and I, I, I haven't looked it up. There's a verse that says that love covereth a multitude of sin. Okay, and I, I don't think that that word sin there means wrongdoings. I think that word sin has the idea that, you know, hey, Bob Rennick is going to do things differently than I do, but what Bob is doing is not necessarily wrong. Even though I think they might be wrong, they're not necessarily wrong, but love will cover those things up. 
Okay, and so we have to understand that the church of Jesus Christ has to, we, we have to learn to, to live with one another. And let me say this, maybe, may, maybe I'm wrong at saying this, but I tend to think there's a lot of truth doctrinally in this, is that if we can't get along here on earth, how in the world are we going to get along in heaven? <laughs> now, I know what you're saying. We all are going to have a new body, so therefore we're, we're going to be different in heaven. Yes, I understand that. But you know something? We need to learn to get along with one another here on earth. And you know, that, that means we deal with issues such, such as pride and ego and things like that in our own life. <coughs> I have learned and I'm learning this. I haven't, I haven't conquered this yet, but I'm learning that, you know, instead of praying for, for Bob Rennix to change, I need to pray that my heart changes. I can't, you know, my wife tells me all the time, she says, Randy, put your hula hoop on. Put my hula hoop on, and she says, anything that's in that hula hoop, that's what, that's what you can affect. Anything outside that hula hoop, you have no control over. Well, when I put a hula hoop on, there's not much space left. <laughs> there's not much I can control in life. There isn't. But God can and, and I, I think the point is that we need to allow God to work. And that's the third thing about the church. Notice what it says there at the end of the verse. It says that it's a place of God in the spirit. That the, the church of Jesus Christ is a place where God dwells, both in our heart, our hearts are the temple of the Holy Ghost. But I think that we ought to be praying every week that the spirit of God moves upon this building. This is God's house. This is God's temple. This is God's place. Now, he's entrusted it to us as stewards, and I understand all that, but it's still God's house. And we, the, the Holy Spirit, you know, it, it's, it's sad to me, and I, maybe you've never experienced this, but I've been in churches where I've walked into the church, and I can, I can tell that the Spirit of God is not even there. Now, now, because it's a Christian church, and because the people there are Christians, the Spirit of God is there, but the Spirit of God has been grieved and has been... Uh, has been quenched, and because of that, there's no power. We need to understand that here at North Chester, if we're going to be a church that God honors and that God wants, we need to be one of these churches that are growing, that are, that are built together with, with, with people, uh, not of the same mind, but of the same spirit, willing to work together for Jesus Christ. And then finally, we need to be a church where we're, uh, where we're seeing the Holy Spirit in its place. Listen, I, I'll, tell this, I'll say this. I think the Holy Spirit's been working in our, in, 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 at North Chester here in the past year, year and a half. Even with COVID-19, God's been at work. You know, I see it. I don't know if you do, but I see it. And you know something? You know what, what concerns me? When God's working, Satan's going to work overtime. Don't let Satan get in. We need to do everything we can to keep Satan out. And, uh, and how do we do that? We confess sin. We, 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 we work at doing and saying, okay, Lord, I can't control Pam. I can't. You know, she's my wife. She's your wife. You should be able to control her. I can't control Pam. I never could and never will. But God can. I need to make sure my heart is right. She needs to make sure her heart is right. Bob needs to make sure his heart is right. You know, Pat needs to make sure her heart is right. Pastor Russ needs to make sure. You know, I could go on all through this congregation. You need to make sure your heart is right. Why? So that the Holy Spirit will dwell in our place. Now, Paul, in chapter 3, we're getting to chapter 3. Paul says this. Look at what it says in chapter 3, verse 1. It says, for this reason. What does that mean, for this reason? Paul has just presented the church. He has just presented this new family, this new building, this new living organism. And he says, because of this, and jump down to verse 14, if you will, in chapter 3. He says again in verse, in verse 14, um, he says this in verse 14, for this reason. See, from verse 1 to chapter 14, he takes a parenthesis. And, and, he, and, and that's what I want to look at today. But it's interesting. Paul is saying, because of the church of Jesus Christ, he says, let me bow the knee and let me pray. Okay, in chapters 1 and 2, we, we have seen what God has done. In chapter 3, Paul starts out and says, because of everything God has done, for this reason, I want to bow the knee and I want to pray for you folks, that you may be what God wants you to be. Okay, and we will look at Paul's prayer in probably not until May, but you know, we'll, we'll look at Paul's prayer eventually. 
Okay, but it's interesting, Paul, who is this messenger, this prisoner, this dedicated servant of God, this one who has poured his life into serving the Lord as he's presenting God, he says, listen, for this reason I'm going to pray for you, but before I pray, let me make sure you understand something. I want you to understand the church of Jesus Christ. That's why I've, I've entitled the message today, The Revelation of the Mysterious Church. Before we look at this revelation of the mysterious church, let's open with a word of prayer. Father, thank you for today. I pray that you would touch our hearts, you would minister to us. That it would not be my words, but your words here today. And that, Lord, we would be willing to change whatever needs to be changed in our own life. Lord, you work mightily. I do thank you in Christ Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So Paul's dealing with this new concept. Let me tell you something. All through history, new concepts, new ideas, new things have always been fought. They have. I've experienced it here as a pastor. I remember the first time I started using PowerPoint. Believe it or not, I was told after several weeks, you have to stop using PowerPoint. We don't want that in this church. I know you're saying, what? What? But I don't know if you remember if you folks who were on the board or whatever, you know, this is not. And I remember, uh, I remember it was George Reeves. After about three months, he came back to me and he says, Pastor, you need to start using PowerPoint again. He says, you need to, you, we need to stay up with the times you need, regardless of what people think. You need to stay up with PowerPoint. You know, there's some people, my, my in-laws are some of them, who hate having the words of songs up on the screen. They hate it. Part of the reason is my, my, my mother-in-law, okay, she's a singer, and she likes, to, she likes to sing parts. Okay, You can't sing parts. I don't like the words up on, on PowerPoint because I don't know where, when, when, you know, a lot of times when there's a comma in a sentence, you can take a breath, and there's, you know, I, I, don't, I don't necessarily see the next page ahead of time. I don't, you know, and so it makes it harder for me to sing. It really does. Um, but I also know that when people are using the, uh, using the hymnals to sing, they sing this way. And what, what happens? The voices go into the songbook, bounce back out of, out of that. And when you listen, it sounds like nobody is singing. Okay, so what have we done? We've said, listen, to help the worship do better, we're putting things on PowerPoint. What well, people get upset with it. I've had people leave the church because, you know, you, Pastor, you don't have, you don't have um, a music that's fast enough. And then you have people who have left the church because, Pastor, you have too much music that's too fast. Okay, you're never going to please people. But whenever you introduce something new, there's always problems. That's what's happening in the church here. And Paul is saying, wait a minute, before I go on and I pray for you, let me explain this church thing. This mysterious church that is a total new revelation. Look what it says in our text, if you will. Okay, in verse, and we're going to skip verse 2, we're going to come back to verse 2, and we're going to come back to verse 6. But notice what it says in verse 3. It's had, it says, how by revelation, you know, the term revelation means that God has given some new truths to them. Okay, and it says, how by revelation he made known to me the mystery. What is that mystery? He says, I have already written, uh, written about it. When did he write about it? He wrote about it in verses 19 down through verse 22. He's already dealt with the church just a little bit. He says, he says, I have already written, by which you have already read and may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ. You know, Paul, again, is emphasizing the fact that there's a change. Notice what it says in verse, in verse 5, which in other ages was not made known to the sons of men. It wasn't known beforehand. It wasn't known before, be, before the cross of Jesus Christ. Something has changed at the cross when Jesus Christ died for the sins of mankind. We find that, that, that there's been a change. Why did Christ say, you know, we're going to take communion in a little bit, but why did Christ lift up the cup and then said, in this cup is a new covenant in my blood? Why is it a new covenant? Because it's something that wasn't true in the old times. And we're going to see some of that here this morning. Uh, but, but we find that there's this, 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 this newness in ages to come that the sons of men, they, they have not known, but as it has now been revealed by the Holy Spirit to his apostles and prophets. 
So, so God now is revealing this new truth that I'm sharing with the church. Well, the church is still upset over this. We find, uh, we find several things, several passages of Scripture. In Acts chapter 8 and verse 27. In Acts chapter 8 and verse 27, <coughs> we find that the uh, Philip went, uh, was, uh, was challenged by God, by the Spirit of God, to go along the, uh, the road down to Gaza to talk to a man who was traveling there. He was an Ethiopian. And it says, so he rose and went, and behold, a man of Ethiopia, and a eunuch of great authority under Candace, the queen of Ethiopia, um, who had charge of her treasury and had come to Jerusalem to what? What does it say? Worship. Isn't that what it says? Who was this Ethiopian eunuch? I think he was a man who understood that God is Jehovah. I believe he understood that God was to be worshipped. And so in the Old Testament times, how do you worship? You become a proselyte of Israel. Okay, you become a person who, adop who adopts the laws and the worship of, 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 of the true one and only God, Jehovah. And so he would come up during the feast, he would worship, he would go home. Why? Because that's the way they did it. Now the church comes along, and the church says, and, they, and Paul says, wait a minute, these people now are saved. And so you have people in the church that are saying, wait, 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 wait a minute. If they're saved, they have to follow the law. They have to be obedient to the law. Look what it says in Acts chapter, um, chapter 15 in verse 5. In Acts chapter 15 verse 5 was the council of Jerusalem. Okay, it was a time when, when, when Paul was defending um, salvation by faith and by faith alone. Nothing else. And it says, but some of the sect of the Pharisees, there's those Pharisees again. Okay, but notice what it says, that these Pharisees who believed, they were Christians. They were of the church and they believed that the word of God is to be held true. They were to follow the law that God had given them. And notice what it says, he said that, that, that they arose and they said it is necessary uh, to, to circumcise them and to command them to keep the law of Moses. See, now here's the battle. Now, the, 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 the church is starting to grow and they're having Gentiles that are being saved and the Jewish people are saying, wait a minute, wait a minute. If they're going to be part of us, they have to be circumcised. They have to be follow the law. That's what the Ethiopian eunuch did. That's what people have done for years. But there's something new. There's a new covenant. And this new covenant is this mystery that Paul's talking about. And saying, wait a minute, you don't have to do that. It's interesting, as they debate this, the council comes up with this idea. It says, for it seems good to the Holy Spirit. They prayed about it. They sought God's face. It says, for it seems good to the, to the Holy Spirit and to us to lay upon no greater burden than these necessary things. In other words, we're not adding anything. You don't have to follow the law. See, there's always been a debate in the church, hasn't there? Those things that, uh, that they said they needed to follow, it says that they need to abstain from these things, from things offered to idols. In other words, taking, uh, taking things that have been offered to idols from blood and from, uh, and, and from things strangled and from uh, sexual immorality. I tend to believe if I wanted to summarize that, I would say that this is, we need to walk in a holy manner of life. And that's what Paul talks about. That's what you and I understand. Um, but, uh, but here we find that these men, and I tend to think that this here is still not all the way. They compromised a little bit, but they didn't compromise all the way. Because I don't think, I think the New Testament tells us that if we pray over things, and, and it is good, that is, it's blessed by God. Okay, and so we, we need to understand that, yes, sexual immorality is wrong. There's some sins that are described. But, you know, what about, what about the, uh, the meats that have been offered to idols? There was a whole debate in the church later on that said, hey, we can eat them. And some say we can't eat them. And Paul says, listen, if God, if, if, if God has blessed it, go ahead and eat it, but don't offend the brother. That's a whole different, that's a whole different message. But we find that there's been these... There's been these problems within the, within the church for years and years and years. And guess what? We still have them today. 
We bring something new into the church, right away, there's opposition. Right away, we haven't done it. Do you know how many times I've heard, I've heard in my ministry, I've been in ministry for 30 some, it's 30 some years. I think the church that was, that was the hardest for me was my first church. And every time I did something, I would hear, well, we haven't done that in the past 100 years. Well, yeah, that's probably why you only have 12 people in the church right now. Let's try some new things. My claim of fame is I, I came in, I shouldn't say claim of fame, that doesn't sound real nice. But, but what, what I, I, I wanted to set up a Sunday school program. We had some teens and, and we wanted to set up, set up a Sunday school program. And so I introduced, um, I introduced a regular Baptist Press Sunday school material. Um, that, you know, which is sound, which is good material. I have no problem with the material. We've used it here. We've used Scripture Truth here. We've used other things. But we use regular Baptist here also. And I remember in a business meeting, the former pastor who had retired got up in the business meeting and was so upset that I was changing the church because I was using regular Baptist press material. He got so upset that he ended up in the hospital with a heart attack. <laughs> Because it bothered them so much. For Sunday school material, folks. But all I'm saying is this happens today. Why? Because we're used to doing it this way. And when God moves, it takes us out of our comfort zone. And when we get out of our comfort zone, we're uncomfortable. Where am I the most comfortable? Back here in my comfort zone. And God doesn't... Listen, if we're going to grow... We need to allow the Holy Spirit to move the way the Holy Spirit wants to move here in our church. That's right. I think this is what Paul's talking about. He's saying, listen, there's some changes that have taken place. Let's look at, um, let's look at some of those changes. Look at verse 2. It says, if indeed you have heard of the dispensation of grace of God, which was given to me for you. What's he talking about, the dispensation of grace of God? Now, we understand that salvation is by grace and by grace alone. Now look over in chapter 2 and verse 8. Chapter 2 and verse 8 says, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and not of yourselves, it is a gift of God. You know, it's through, it's through grace that we've been saved through faith. As we hold on by faith to what God has done for us in His grace, we're saved. It's not by works. It goes on in verse, in verse 9. It says, Not by works, as any man should boast. It's not about works. It's about Grace through faith. That's what Paul's talking about in verse 3. He said, he, in, in verse, verse 2 of chapter 3, he's saying, listen, listen, you have heard me preach about this grace. It's interesting, he uses the word dispensation. The term dispensation, I, I you know, just so for you folks who uh, might not know, I, I tend to think I am a pre-trib, pre-millennial, dispensationalist pastor. You might say, whoa, what's that mean? It means I believe the church is going to be raptured before or going to be before Jesus comes back. There's going to be a rapture of the church. I'm, I'm, I'm pre-trib rapture. I believe that if before the Great Tribulation, which is a seven-year period, I believe in the rapture of the church before that. I also believe the, in, in the um, uh, pre, pre-millennial, I believe Jesus Christ is not coming back at the end of the millennial. There's some people that believe that. I believe he's going to come back and then he's going to set up his kingdom for a thousand years. So I believe in pre-trib, I believe in pre-millennial, but I also believe in dispensationalism. Dispensationalism, and I get that from this verse right here. Okay, in this passage, it's talking about an ages past. Notice in, notice in verse 5, I think it said, for which other ages, in other ages, or ages past. He's talking about times beforehand. If you notice in chapter uh, chapter 2, uh, if I'm not mistaken, uh, make, sure I, uh, make sure I have the right thing, the right verse. Chapter 2 and verse 7, in chapter 2 and verse 7, he's talking about, um, he's talking about in, in the ages to come. So he's saying there's times past and there's times to come. See, a dispensation, if I understand dispensationalism, okay, a dispensationalism is a period of time in which God deals with mankind specifically in that period of time. Does that make sense? Maybe not, but let me clarify. Okay, 
The, uh, the, 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 term, the term here we find in this text, dispensation, means stewardship. It's, it's a term given to the household. It's given to the slave who takes care of the household and it says as you administrate or as you do the administration of the house, you are taking care of this during your reign, during this period of time. It's interesting that as you look at dispensationalism, there's a lot. Um, Dr. McKinney, uh, Dr. McKinney wrote a book. You, uh, probably nobody in this room knows who Dr. McKinney is. Um, Dr. McKinney wrote a book called Scanning the Plant. This was, my, uh, this was my Bible book when I took a Bible class at Laterno College back in 19, 1987. Uh, Dr. McKinney was my professor. He was a little, he was a little I think, a little off the wall. Okay, um, in the sense that, the, you know, he says everything's possible for God. He said, he, he made this comment which told me the guy's a little off the wall, but there could be some truth to it. He said, he said if, if man could invent Star Trek, traveling from, from, from planet to planet to planet, don't you think God can do the same thing? And God goes from planet to planet. Okay, I don't believe that. I believe that God created man. And, and, and only man, and it's here on earth. That's my personal belief. You know, you can believe anything you want, but I do believe that God is able to do anything God wants to do. I believe that. He makes this statement about, about, uh, uh, about dispensationalism, and just because the man is off in certain areas doesn't necessarily mean he's off everywhere. But he makes, uh, he makes this, this statement. He says, the Greek word is uh, oikonomia, translated economy or responsibility. Paul is writing of the responsibility God has entrusted to him. The preaching of Christ, unsearchable riches to all mankind. He also says this responsibility is committed to all who have trusted in Christ. This term dispensation comes from the Latin meaning management. Okay? Um, and, and that's the picture we have here in this in, in here. C.I. Schofield. C.I. Schofield is one of those uh, Bible theologians. Lot sometimes you might have heard of the Schofield Bible. Uh, he has a lot of notes in it. He makes this comment. He says about uh, about dispensation. He says a a dispensation is a period of time during which God deals in a particular way with a man in respect to sin and to man's responsibility. So for this period of time, God's dealing with man in a certain way. During this period of time, God's dealing with man a certain way. During this period of time, God is dealing with man a certain way. And as you study scripture, you find that God deals with men differently in different ages. And he tells us here that there's ages to pass and there's ages to come. As you study dispensationalism, I believe there are, there are, um, there are a, a variety of dispensations. I believe that there are seven dispensations that we find in Scripture. Let me just give them to you. I'm giving you a, a little doctrinal class here this morning. Okay, there's the, there's the age of innocence. Okay, the, the, the dispensation of innocence. What is that? That was one between when Adam and Eve were created and Adam and Eve sinned. Okay, he dealt, God dealt with Adam and Eve totally different than he did with Adam and Eve after they sinned. There's this dispensation of, of, of Adam and Eve, you know, of, of innocence. We need to understand that. There's also the dis dispensation of conscience. Once their, uh, once their eyes were opened, God had to deal with them in a different way. Okay? We also find that there's human government. Okay? Once, uh, um, you know, before the flood, there was this human government that started after Cain and Abel. We find that there's this, this, this human government, and we find that God set up this human government, and the human government, they failed. What did they do? They built the battle of, uh, of, of Babel. So what did God do? He sent a flood. Okay? We find that there's a promise. God made a promise to, uh, to, uh, to Abraham. He made a promise to Noah. But God, there's a, the age of promise. Uh, we also find the law. After, uh, after uh, Abraham, uh, Isaac, Abraham uh, Esau, Isaac, and Jacob, we find that God dealt with Israel a little bit different than beforehand. Why? Because they became a nation. And so what did God do? He gave them the law. Okay, we also find after the law, we find that there's a dispensation of grace. 
We find that that dispensation of grace is a time where it starts at the cross of Jesus Christ when Jesus died for our sin. Now we're no longer, what does Hebrew tell us? We're no longer under that law, but we're what? Under the blood of Jesus Christ. He offered it once and for all. He did offer it. You know, today we're only remembering that Jesus Christ died for our sins. We're not re-sacrificing Christ. The Jewish people had to on a day, on a yearly basis re-sacrifice that blood and cover their sins because it was only covered it wasn't taken away our sins are taken away it's a different dispensation we also find the kingdom we find that there's a dispensation, the last dispensation in ages to come there's going to be a kingdom and the word of God speaks of about a thousand year reign now I know some of you are thinking, wait a minute, I thought, I thought it was all about covenants. And, and yes, some, of you, some people believe in covenant theology. I believe in dispensationalism. You can believe however you want as long as we're agreeing that the Word of God is the Word of God and it's true no matter what. Okay, we, uh, we find out that there's, there's some cycles in each one of those dispensations. There's a covenant. It starts with a covenant. I'm going to make a covenant with my people. Um, and there's scripture that goes along. There's duration of time. It's last for a period of time. A dispensation is between two periods of time. There's the condition of man. There's a test that God gives. Are they going to pass the test or are they going to fail the test? There's the failure of man. There's the judgment of God. There's the grace, God's gracious provision. And I know you're saying, wait a minute, I haven't, taught, I haven't gotten all these down yet. Okay, I'll put it back on. <laughs> Give you a minute to, uh, to, to catch up. Okay, the failure of man, judgment of God, provision, requirements for salvation, and then the picture of Christ. Each one of the dispensations has a picture of Christ. See, in the, um, and, and uh, let, me, uh, let me just go back just so, just so we will give you an example. In the, in the dispensation of innocence, okay, starting with creation, God told Adam and Eve to do what? He told Adam and Eve that they were to recognize, they were to have dominion over the earth. You're going to have dominion over the, over the, 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 the animals of the sea, over the animals of the land, over the animals. They named the animals, they did all, the, all that kind of thing, but they had dominion over the earth. Okay, the, um, the, the scripture that we find is Genesis 1, 26 through 3, 24, after they sinned. There in, 20, in, uh, in chapter 324, we find that they disobeyed God. The duration of time, we know, um, that, you know, we're, we're, we're really not sure when the creation took place. That is, that's a hard one to come by. Uh, the condition of man, the condition of man was that, uh, uh, was that they, uh, they, were, they were innocent. Okay? They had a heart that was... That was in tune with God. Why? Because the word God said that they were created in God's image. So they had a, a nature that was godly nature. That's the condition of man. Okay? The test. The test was don't eat of this fruit. Here's a tree. I want you to eat of everything else, but don't touch this tree. Okay? We, uh, we find the failure of man. What did they do? They sinned. They disobeyed God. And they went and ate what God told them not to eat. The judgment of God. They were, ex they were expelled. They were thrown out of the garden. Judgment of God. We find the, uh, the God's gracious provision. He provided a lamb for them. Remember, he took, he took the, the goats, he took the lamb, and he sacrificed them and made coats of lamb skin. The requirement... The requirement for salvation, okay, was faith and blood. The requirement for salvation, they had to trust God. And it's always through the blood. It's interesting, in all seven dispensations, that's always the same thing. Salvation never changes. The old People have asked me, well, how do the Old Testament saints get saved? By faith, by the grace of God, through, through grace, the blood of Jesus Christ. In the New Testament, how do they get saved? By faith and by blood. During the tribulation time, how do they get saved? By faith, by blood. 
It's always by faith and by love. During the kingdom time, you might say, well, he reigns. Yes, but we're still human beings. By faith, by the love. That never changes. There's only one way a person can go to heaven. And that's through the shed blood of Jesus Christ. That's God's grace. That's what we're talking about. That's the dispensation of grace. Okay, the last thing here is the picture of Christ. What was the picture of Christ? The picture of Christ here was the goat, the goat skin is a picture of the righteousness of Christ. Remember in the New Testament we're told that we're going to put on God's righteousness, put off the old, put on the new. That's, we see that all the way back in the Old Testament with Adam and Eve. Every one of these dispensations that I've mentioned we find these ten things to be true. We find that this is what God is... That this is the new thing Paul is talking about. And, and Paul here is talking about what? A dispensation of the grace of God. Because during the law, the children of Israel did not obey God the way they were supposed to. What were they supposed to do? They were supposed to, to point the world to Jesus Christ, but they failed. And what was their punishment? They were scattered abroad. And God said, I'm going to, I'm going to, to graft in the Gentiles, and I'm going to make them. And so during the period of time called the age of grace, from the cross to the, I believe, to the rapture of the church, what happens after the rapture of the church? I believe the law kicks back in for seven years. I believe, I believe that there's a parenthesis in here. It's the church age. It's the age of grace. It's what we're talking about here. And, and, and God has allowed us to say, now it's not about being Jew or Gentile. It's about being in Christ Jesus. It's about being one in Him. It's about being together in Him. And the picture we have here is a picture of a new people, a new people, a people that are that, that have, and, and that's where that's where he goes. Jump down to verse six. Jump down in verse six. We find this. We we we've done, we don't you know in verse two we find the dispensation, um, and, and we've talked about these different dispensations, the definition, and some of the some of the things in dispensations. But in verse in uh, in verse six, we find the new recipient. Notice the recipients. The recipients, Paul says this, that the Gentiles. This was, the Gentiles were never able to be truly part of Israel. And God says, now it's something new. Why? It's called grace. And I'm going to allow the Gentiles to be part of the family of God. Oh, can't have that. They're Gentiles. No, they're people saved by grace. It's all about the grace of God. That's the dispensation that Paul is dealing with here. The new recipients, the Gentiles, there in verse 4. That's, that's who they knew. There's also a new relationship. Look what it says there in verse 6. Not only are they Gentiles, but they become something new. And that's the new relationship. And it's a relationship with each other and it's a relationship with God. Let me tell you something. If our relationship with God is not right, our relationship with people isn't going to be right. That's right. And, and can I say it a little bit differently? If our relationship with people is not right, our relationship with God's not going to be right. I think it goes both ways. It says here in verse 6 that there's three things with regards to this new relationship. Number one, the Gentiles became heirs of God. Think about that. Heirs to God. Romans chapter 8. In Romans chapter 8, 15 through 17 talks about this. And in Romans chapter 8 it says this, For you did not receive the spirit of bondage. This is our theme verse for this year. You did not receive the spirit of bondage again unto fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption by whom you cry, Abba, Father. Now there's a relationship we have with God. He is our daddy. He is our father. Why? Because we've been adopted. He's already talked about adoption in chapter 1 and verse 7. He talks about adoption in chapter 2. We find that there's, there's this picture of adoption. We are now part of the family of God. He goes on. Paul goes on in Romans 8 verse 16. He says, the spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if children, then heirs 
heirs with God and joint heirs with Jesus Christ. That blows my mind. I'm a joint heir with Jesus Christ. Now, now, remember, Jesus is God. And he says, I'm joint heirs with God, with Jesus. I mean, I, I don't know about you, but that, that tends to boggle my mind. The creation is co-heirs with the creator. That's a new concept that the church was struggling with. You and I don't struggle with that. We understand that. We're part of the family of God. We've been bought into the family. We've been paid with a price. The blood of Jesus Christ. Yes, we have all that. But you know something? This is a brand new mysterious concept to these people. I don't understand it. He goes on in Colossians chapter, uh, in Colossians chapter 1. He tells us also that we're part of the, the body of Christ. Notice what it says there in Ephesians chapter 6. Chapter 6, he says that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs of the same body. In Colossians chapter 1 and verse 18, it says, And he, Christ, is the head of the body. See, we have a picture in Scripture in the New Testament that Christ is the head and we are the body. And some of us are fingers and some of us are toes and some of us are feet and some of us are legs and some of us are arms and some of us are, 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 are you know, we go on. We, we all have been given different gifts and we all do different things and we all have a purpose and we all have a reason and we all, we, we all function together. Why? So we can glorify God. But He is the head. I'd venture to say... That, uh, you know, there's a, there's a legend in France, in Paris, that one of the martyrs, one of the Christian martyrs got his head chopped off for his faith. He picked up his head, ran, I don't know how many miles, up to where they built the Sacred, the sacred Heart Church. That's where he finally dropped, and he dropped dead from having his head chopped off. Listen, I can guarantee if we chopped your head off today, you're not picking it up, you're not going there. Because without your head, there is no function in the body. Without Jesus Christ, there is no function in the body. Okay, we're not picking it up for a little bit, we're not running with it for a little bit. There's a lot of, there's a lot of churches out there that don't even have Jesus Christ in them that are just dead churches. My friends, we need to understand that the church of Jesus Christ is a church where, yes, we all have a different function, and yes, we all have, you know, we, you know, the, the, the right hand, you know, my right hand doesn't function as my left hand does, because I'm right-handed. And so I can do things with my right hand, I can't do with my left hand. We have right-handed, we have left-handed in the church. Maybe, maybe you're a hand that's a right-handed, maybe you're a hand that's a left-handed. It doesn't mean that what you're doing is wrong. It doesn't mean what I'm doing is wrong. It just means we're doing it differently. Why? For the purpose of making sure that we're doing what the head tells us to do, and that's Jesus Christ. This is a new concept. It goes on. It says not only, um, not only are, they, are, they, um, are they members of the same body, but they're also members of the same promise. And notice what it says here. It says here, and partakers of his promise. In Christ Jesus. What's that promise? I believe that promise is eternal life. That promise of strength. That promise of blessing. There's, there's many heavenly promises we're not going to go through this morning. But that is, what, that is what we find Jesus is talking about here in our text. That is what we find Paul is dealing with. This new church. Now what's the purpose of the church? We'll look at that in a couple weeks after Easter, but the, 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 the purpose, you know, it's this, Paul is saying, listen, folks, I, I don't want you to, I don't want you to start fighting amongst yourselves over this new concept. It's the church of Jesus Christ. And guess what? We're still fighting over the church. We do it this way, and you do it that way, and, 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 and we believe we should do it here. And we, you know, I, you know we, we, we come together for what? For the purpose of worshiping our Heavenly Father. It's not about the music we listen to. It's not about, it's not about the, uh, you know, it's not about any of that. It's about coming and giving honor and glory to God. I really believe that. We're going to look at the purpose of the church next week, but let me ask you this. Are you in tune with God today? Are you allowing, are you, are you one, is there a oneness? Is there a unity? Are, do you realize that, that He is 
He is your Lord and your Savior. The only way we can really, really allow Him to do that is when we surrender all to God. Have you surrendered it all to God? Let's close with a word of prayer today. Father, Lord, I pray. Lord, we did a lot of historical things. We did talk about a lot of things today. But the bottom line is that, Lord, you are the head of the church. And, Lord, as being of one body, as being part of your body, we need to submit to the head. And so, Lord, help us submit to you today. Lord, as we close with this song, I surrender all, Lord. Help me learn to surrender my way, my thoughts, my desires. Lord, help me not to be one who is fighting the system, but, Lord, one who is obedient to my Lord and my King. The one who is willing to do what my Lord says by faith, knowing that you always provide. And so, Lord, work in my life today. And that means, Lord, I have to give up some of my own things sometimes. And, Lord, that's okay. We want your perfect will in our lives. I do thank you in Christ Jesus. Before I say amen. Before I say amen. Are you willing to surrender it all to him? We all have attitude, we all have, we all have struggles, we all have difficulties. Are you willing to say, Lord, I surrender it all, all to you? If that's your testimony today, and, and maybe you've done it already today, but if that's, if that's what your heart's desire is, Lord, I want every day, all day, I want to surrender it to you. Would you just raise your hand and say, Pastor, that's me, I want, I want to do that. Would you just raise your hand, thank you, thank you, thank you. Father, I thank you for the hands that went up. That, Lord, we would learn to surrender to you all things. We thank you in Christ Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand together. Uh, we're going to close our service. This part of the service, we're going to have communion in just a minute. We're going to say goodbye to our, uh, to our visitors online. Um, and uh, we're going to sing and during the, uh, during the song. John, go ahead and shut things off. Uh, but uh, we're going to uh, sing together. I surrender all. All to Jesus I surrender. Thank you, folks, you may be seated.